Well, welcome. My name is Rob Lively. I will serve as the moderator of this session on teaching and education. Uh, I served my Fulbright in Germany, and I also serve as the program chair for the conference. And along with a wonderful committee of colleagues, we have read every proposal that came in, over 130 panel and poster proposals. And uh, each proposal was read multiple times by multiple people. And so those of you that are presenting and those that are presenting at the conference are those that have just kind of risen to the top. And so you're to be congratulated. And from what I've seen thus far, um, it's been an excellent conference. What I will do is that I will read through the, the folks that will be presenting with their titles and a little bit about their background. You can read more about their biographies on the uh, Fulbright Association website. Uh, why don't you, those of you that are watching, if you could, at the, in the chat button, just indicate your name, uh, where you are and where you served your Fulbright. And then for those of you that have questions for the presenters, please go to the, question, the Q and A section. And when you're writing a question, please be sure to indicate the person's name that you're addressing the question to. So, so in this order, and each person is going to be given 10 minutes presentation time. First, we have Celia Blandon, who will be talking about text talk time strategy engaging students in discussion, active listening, and engagement dialogue through children's literature in a dual language program. Celia teaches at Gove Elementary School as a dual language teacher in Florida. She has taught Spanish, French, as world well languages from elementary to college level. She was a Fulbright Hayes Seminar Scholar to Peru in 2016. Next, we have Maylene Chong and Marco Beltran Semblantes, uh, who will be speaking on bridging language and culture through Zoom. Maylene was an English teaching assistant in Ecuador, 2017-18. She is a bilingual Peruvian Chinese immigrant from Peru, currently residing in New Hampshire. In other words, she's my neighbor. She is a Boston Public Schools bilingual teacher. Marco teaches at a university in Ecuador. Unfortunately, I don't have any more bio information on Marco, so perhaps you could share that when you, when you speak. Next, we have Dr. Wesley Curtis and Jody Pritt, uh, keeping the dream alive through international student advocacy. Wesley is director of English programs for internationals at the University of South Carolina. He works to support students whose personal, academic, and professional goals require increased language, language uh, proficiency. He also serves as the Vice President of the Consortium of University and College Intensive English Programs. Jody is a 2012 recipient of the Fulbright International Education Administrator Seminar Grant in South Korea and is the Director of International Student and Scholar Services at Georgia State University. She is also a doctoral student at the University of Missouri, Columbia, where she's studying educational administration and policy analysis. Next, we have Dr. Darlene D. Marie, who will be speaking on a Fulbright Scholar Award to South Africa resulted in bi-directional learning. Darlene is the Fulbright Faculty Advisor for the University of South Florida and is on the Faculty of Educational Psychology in the College of Education. She has had two very different Fulbright Scholar Awards to South Africa in 2007 and 9 and Budapest, Hungary, 2019-2020. She's past president of the Mid-Florida Chapter of the Fulbright Association. And then finally, we have Dr. Andrea Honigsfield, and Dr. Maria Dove, who will be speaking on dual capacity model for teachers collaboration towards a theory of teacher learning for English learners. Andrea is Associate Dean and Professor in the School of Education and Human Services at Malloy College in Rockville Center in New York. She directs a doctoral program in educational leadership for diverse learning communities. Before entering the field of teacher ed, she was an English as a foreign language teacher in Hungary. 
and in and a, English as a second language teacher in New York City. Maria is also a professor in the School of Education and Human Services at Malloy College. She is primarily teaches TESOL courses to pre-service and in-service teachers. Before entering higher ed, she provided instruction for over 30 years to English learners in public school settings and in adult ed language programs in the greater New York City area. So we welcome all of the you that are watching. Uh, this is poster fair number two, teaching and education. So Celia, we will, we will hand it over to you. Okay, thank you. I have any honor to be here surrounded by very educated uh, colleagues, you know, but um, at the present time I attend, I'm attending Florida International University. Hopefully someday I'll get a higher degree. But um, my presentation is where does the world goes from here? That's the topic of the theme of this Fulbright conference. And I always have in my classroom, uh, Mr. Fulbright's uh, mantras. And one of them, education is a slow and moving, but powerful force. So the students can see that they can get um, inspired. Okay, next slide. Is somebody moving the slides? Okay. Uh, text some strategy, engaging students in discussion, active listening and engagement dialogue with children's literature in a dual language program. I used this strategy before um, in pre-reading, uh, during reading and after reading. Um, I teach um, a small groups intervention for first and second grades, uh, Spanish speakers. And um, we find that, uh, I found that this strategy that very, they, they like it and they feel very, um, they feel good about it, you know. So we st I started doing this at the beginning of the year and it's kind of challenging doing virtual and face-to-face, -face, but so far we're moving along. Okay. Uh, why children's books? is promotes key for brain development, help a child learn after thought, help children imagine objects and create images, connects adult and child to magical places. Uh, I'm using a, um, a, um, a book about um, famous uh, persons in the United States. And the one I chose was Martin Luther King. And that creates, they have, they are, they are familiar with Martin Luther King, but they create other ideas on what they have read. So the um, two vocabulary words that I used for this was uh, leader. And the other one was uh, orador, which is a uh, speaker and leader, okay. And it's also help the students to connect to other curriculum areas in science, art, social studies, drama, mathematics, be music, language, health, and culture. Next slide. Okay, thank you. Um, this was created by, this model was developed by Isabel Beck and Margaret McKeon, and it delivers a uh, robust vocabulary instruction of sophisticated words with rich talk about text, and it provides the student with critical language and reading comprehension skills, and increases students' knowledge of vocabulary to provide students with critical language and reading comprehension skills. And it also introduces after a story has been read to the students. So I begin with this uh, format, and I will, the uh, sheet that I use for this is at the end, and I always introduce it before the reading, and then we go over because the students, uh, my students, you have to, I have also students with a learning disability, so you have to kind of like uh, walk them through it and model over and over until they get the gist of the word. Next slide, okay. The purpose of the strategy is to identify main ideas for different selections of text and to develop your method metacognitive skills, thinking about thinking, and to better determine what you understand and what you don't understand when it comes to reading, and it be to become a critical reader. So the more words they know, they are able to link them into the other curriculum areas that I mentioned before. Next slide. Thank you. Um, as you're reading, as you're reading, sorry, pause and gives a brief explanation for each target word, gives an explanation for any words that affect reading comprehension, and the explanation should not affect the flow of the story. Target words are explained after reading the story. So we read the story aloud first. 
After I introduce the words, then we do the reading, storing out loud. Next slide. After reading the story, um, I introduce the word again, and we introduce the meaning of the words one at a time. We contextualize the word, we use it in context. Where is, the, where is the word being used in the story? They say the word, um, then the student gives a uh, friendly explanation about it, and then they have to provide a different sentence or a different context of use. And then the students engages in activity with a word, and then the student says the word again. Uh, it, bringing the target words together, after introducing the words one at a time, I provide opportunities for students to use the words together. I pose different questions. Using all the target words, develop one thought question and then challenge the student to answer it. And then the question, the student would have two choices. Develops a question in which the students must choose, sorry, must choose the target word that best describes a particular situation. And one context using a single context to develop a question for each of the words and have the student answer a set of questions. I also use questions and prompts the prompts to develop an open-ended discussion prompt for each of the words. Okay, and this is my product. Now, um, the students on the top, if you notice, I translated, it has um, orador, and then a breve definition, definition the students uh, told me what the word meant, and then they used it in context. El Dr. Luther King fue un orador. Dr. Martin Luther King was a speaker. And then the student, estudiante, dice la palabra, he says the word, grand leader. Then brief definition, habla para la gente. He says, speaks for the people. And then a student would ask questions. ¿Qué mensaje voy a la gente? ¿Qué mensaje uh, voy a darle a la gente? Now, my students are in the first stages of uh, language acquisition. They can still, I'm still helping them putting the words together. Next slide. Okay. And Texta provides engaging literature in a variety of topics, and a student increases their involvement with word acquisition and feel motivated to learn more words successfully. So this is strategy um, works for me and in different groups, depending on the books on the different levels of the students. I want to thank you very much for listening to my presentation. If any questions, I'll be glad to answer at the end. But I'm very honored to be surrounded by all these knowledgeable individuals. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Lively, for managing the slides. Good. Well, well, thank you very much. The you actually have about three minutes left. Do you do you have, let's say, a a um, a particular student that you'd like to mention or talk about, a, almost kind of like a little case study of, of something that was really successful or surprised yes. you? Or... Um, last year I had my little friend Pilar. She was my second grade student. And then I was, her mother asked me to tutor her. Um, so during the classes that I'm taking at Florida International, she was one of my students out of the ones that I work with. And then I use this strategy because um, also it helps my students to work on phonemic awareness and phonics too. Um, some of my students, um, Spanish speakers, um, they still have weakness on phonics. And Pilar was one of them. She, was, she had a learning disability. Um, she's now in the fifth grade. And uh, it was, um, I met with her after school and I use like a very simple, um, very like uh, at her level books, and then I build it up a little bit at a time. And what she liked about it is that she was able to uh, look at the word, she will spell it out, she will do her phonics combination, consonant, vowel, consonant, she will repeat the word, and then she will look at the word in dictionary, she will write it up. So when it became repetitive, um, I would ask her, like, I would tutor her two days. And then I spoke to her teacher too. So I worked along with her teacher to coordinate what book she was reading. So pretty much I was a support system for her classroom teacher. Thank you. 
-hmm. And right now I'm using the same strategy for uh, my morning group. So I work along with the teachers to see how I can support in reading because they need that push. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, thank you very much. I love children's books, especially reading them to children. Um, and as you know, of course, reading to our both our own children and then our grandchildren, those kids, they know those books. And if you if you leave out a word or if you skip a line, they will correct you. Yes. And 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 it's interesting that in different contexts, they will be using the words that uh, they've learned through the reading. So. There, is, there is one book that I like. Um, actually, um, I got it from Mr. Robert Forbes, you know, from Forbes magazine. He, oh, yes. uh, Robert Forbes, Robert J. Forbes, he has three books, three, and they're poetry. And I use the ones that had the short verses for phonemic awareness, you know, rhyming and stuff. And they have, it's very creative. And then I met with him and I said, um, give me more tips on how to go about it. So I took my students on a field trip to meet with him and he read those books. So what I did, I would, for them to be familiar with Mr. Forbes, I taught uh, maybe one or two of his poems and a little stories. So when they went to see him, they were already able to link uh, what was on the book. And then he had um, an scavenging hunt at the Ford uh, Society of the Art Museum in, in Palm Beach. So he link, he has an activity for the students that links his book to that to the uh, scavenging hunt, which consists mm -hmm. of having pictures of all his uh, books, you know, the that they were that he has on this, you know, on the on each page, and then the students have to find the title of the story. So they have to, like I said before, like in text, so they have to create their images and it also helps them to kind of like use their thinking skills to see, you know. Great, well, thank you so much. This, that's, that's very interesting. And folks, if you have questions uh, for her, please just go to the Q&A section and, and add your questions there. Next, we'd like to uh, turn it over to Maylene and Marco. Thank you, Rob. I'm going to be sharing my screen now. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Okay, thank you, Mary. So just uh, first, I want to tell you uh, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Marco Beltran, and I want to tell you a little bit more about myself because at uh, the beginning, uh, Rob required this. So just, uh, I work uh, at Technical University of Cotopaxi in La Tacuna in Ecuador. Uh, actually, I am the English coordinator, so it was why I know many Fulbright assistants. So that's the that pleasure for me to be here, and I am going to share with uh, all of you our project. Okay, so thank you. Now, um, maybe next, please. Okay, so uh, firstly, I am going to explain you this uh, project in a timeline. So at the beginning, as you can see in my slide, we have this one uh, in October 2019, when this uh, problem, this pandemic occurs, uh, we had an assistant in our university. So her name was uh, Carmen Carol, and she was working with us when the pandemic happened. So in that moment, she was required to evacuate it from Ecuador. So she usually helped us to improve our student skills, especially as speaking. So that's why after this uh, problem, I was thinking how to help my students to continue improving their skills, right? So in that moment, I remember uh, the last uh, Fulbright assistant, the former uh, Fulbright, and I talked to Maylene. Uh, with Maylene, we decide to think, to do something about this one. And um, together we plan an idea in order to help our students uh, to be in contact with the, with the language. So at this, as you can see in the timeline, in May 2020, we planned, we, we studied many possibilities in order to organize and schedule. 
So finally, in June 2020, we start with this dream. So what I told you, that's a dream because it was something that at the beginning I thought it was a little difficult, but with uh, mailing help, it happens. So this is the timeline and the first moments that uh, this project born. So Maylene is going to tell you more about this. Thank you, Maylene. Thank you, Marco. So as Marco mentioned, we had um, former um, Fulbright ETAs in the United States who have a connection with, with Marco. So what I did was I gathered all those former ETAs. I talked to other volunteers who happened to um, have attended the same university as me, Wheelock College in Boston, Mass, who were all trained as teachers, social workers, and juvenile justice uh, specialists. So I contacted them, they contacted their friends, and we created this network of volunteers. So we from the United States connected with the students from the Universidad Técnica de Cotopaxi in La Tacunga, Ecuador, where Marco was at. And what we did was we not only networked through Zoom, but that's how we used, um, that's the platform we used for classes, for connecting with the university students. So... The 22 volunteers um, were actually spread all over the United States. So due to the pandemic, a lot of uh, my friends had to go back to their homes. Um, and it was really interesting to have three different time zones, um, but we made it work. So all those 22 volunteers from six different states connected with uh, um, 210 university students from the Universidad Técnica de Cotopaxi. So putting all of that together in a real, like in the um, real situation, we made hundreds of new relationships, right? So in a place where this whole world was chaotic and we were just trying to figure this whole pandemic out, we somehow made community, which was really, really um, unexpected in those times of horror, right? Um, so that was really, really good. And what Marco said, what um, he thought it was a dream, like kind of not really feasible, turned out to be something wonderful where we created many different relationships. Um, so not only did we create those relationships, but we also wanted to focus on that English component. Like Marco mentioned, La Universidad Técnica de Cotopaxi in La Tacunga has always received a Fulbright English teaching assistant. So having had Karen be evacuated, it kind of messed things up a little bit, right? And so Marco was at lost and he wanted to make sure that um, he was still getting some um, I don't want to say native speakers, but because I'm not a native speaker, but people from the United States to help um, out with the conversational English, right? With having them practice and hear um, English from a different country. So in total, our 22 volunteers and our 210 students did a total of 336 hours of instruction via Zoom. And out of those hours of connecting via Zoom, 280 hours of them were full of English instruction, including grammar, conversational, fluency, etc. Not only did we have these uh, results of hours, but we also had a lot of qualitative results. So we not only were able to speak in English, practice English, but we were able to have a deeper understanding of cultural differences. So we really exchanged. And I think because the groups were smaller versus what Karen would have done um, being one ETA to like 40 or 30 students, we actually had one volunteer to 10 or 12 students. So those connections and those talks about culture and relationships and just everything overall were more deeper. Um, and also the acquisition of conversational English, correct? Because that was our, one of our goals. Um, there was a lot of grammar talk as well as some ETAs, uh, sorry, as some uh, volunteers focused on that uh, component of language. Another really important thing that we wanted to point out was in despite of chaos all over the world, um, we did build community over the current events and political awareness of what was happening on in the world. So we were able to compare exactly what was going on in the United States, what was happening in um, Ecuador and how those two culturals, um, culture and political uh, events have been happening and, and comparing them and talking about it and really spending time to learn vocabulary in English um, about those um, events. 
Um, and then I'm not going to read all of these, um, but we did also want to gather um, information about um, what the students actually thought about the experience. So I called some students up, I grabbed what they said, and all of these are translated. Um, however, one thing that I do want to point out is that a lot of them, oh, almost all of them, mentioned that they were super happy to have gotten this authentic relationship. Although it was over Zoom, they thought that this was such an authentic, real, genuine, raw relationship that built, and they were able to learn authentic English, what they called. Um, so that is something that I found really, really interesting talking to all of them. Um, so it proved that although there was chaos, a community and a lot of uh, learnings were brought up, correct? And the other really interesting thing I wanted to point out, and I just thought it was wonderful when this person mentioned it, was that they said I was able to travel without getting on a plane. And that right there was the most beautiful thing I heard because it's true. Like there's so much going on nowadays that we can't travel. Oh, we can travel, but we choose not to travel for our health, right? So the fact that they thought that they were able to connect with us so deeply um, to the point that they thought they actually were like in the United States and we thought we were in Ecuador was priceless. Um, so those are little things uh, that you can read. Um, I'll stay for like 10 more seconds and then Marco will end the conclusions. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you about the last part, which is uh, really nice to tell you. Okay, now, now, what were some of the benefits that we get with this one? So first one, we have great new ideas born within this pandemic. So as I told you before, it was at the beginning a dream. So for that reason, if you know, when we have a difficult situation and we have to face something that is really hard for all of us, uh, is when something interesting born. So for that reason, this is really, really important to point it out. Now, after that, I want to tell you that we created solid networks uh, where we can exchange the culture. So of course, it was really, really nice because our students exchanged ideas with the assistants, with the volunteers. So, which was really, really interesting and useful for our students because, as you know, in Ecuador, sometimes uh, the students who study in public institutions don't have the possibility to practice with a native speaker or with all of the native speakers at the same time. So, it was great because they had the opportunity to talk, to speak directly, and to ask them maybe if they, they have something uh, they don't understand. So, for example, when, uh, in, when we use our books, sometimes we have some specific topics with that related about the culture, especially American culture. So, for example, about Halloween, sometimes they don't understand uh, something about how they do or what they celebrate this. Week. So they have the opportunity to ask direct to the people who uh, live there. So it was the best thing. And also, I want to tell you that my students in our university uh, feel like uh, very confident because they say the volunteers, the assistants are really nice people because they understand that sometimes we can speak uh, totally in, Spanish, in English. So they usually speak in Spanish too. So it was great. Now, after that, I have uh, Ecuadorian students learn authentic American culture. So it was, as I mentioned before, the best thing because our students learn a lot, believe me. They learn a lot because they had the opportunity to ask direct to the people who work in the United States. And of course, as a final result, our students feel motivated because now, now they want to continue with this one because they say, uh, teacher, we had the opportunity to talk with native speakers. Now we can continue with this one because it's great. So few students in Ecuador have this opportunity. So, and I want to point it that Melin uh, give us this opportunity because she worked a lot with us. She contact many volunteers and she asked if they want to participate, if, if they want to work with us and it, was the result. So thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I have a good friend who's a medical doctor and he said that the greatest advances in medicine occur really during times of trauma and war. And thinking about this, this conference in general and specifically what you've been talking about 
kind of the trauma of the pandemic has caused uh, us to, to come up with new ways of doing things, aren't they? New creative ways and new ideas, as you're saying. So um, something really good is coming out of this, isn't it? So thank you so much. And we'd like now to turn it over to Dr. Wesley Curtis and Jody Pritt. Okay, thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. I'm so happy to see so many attendees for these presentations. Uh, I've personally encountered that with different conferences, uh, sometimes attendance is not as robust as it is here today. I am Wesley Curtis. I'm the Director of English Programs for Internationals at the University of South Carolina. And I'm also currently serving in the member elected role of Vice President of the Consortium of University and College Intensive English Programs. My colleague is Jody Pritt, and she'll say a brief introduction. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. And I just echo what Dr. Curtis has said. It's really amazing to see all the engaged learning happening, even uh, in these kind of new uh, technologies that we're all trying to do this together through. So I appreciate that very much. And thank you for having us today. Again, my name is Jody Pritt. I am the Director of International Student and Scholar Services at Georgia State University in downtown Atlanta. Well, I wanted to briefly mention that the title of our presentation is Keeping the Dream Alive Through International Student Advocacy. And although the conference theme is related to Dr. King's last book, we really felt that the presentation itself was appropriate to tie into Dr. King's address at the March on Washington in uh, March of 63, in part because we believe that that dream of individuals being judged based upon the content of their character, not the color of their skin is under assault. And that's particularly the case because of some of the things that have been happening with the US immigration regulatory environment. And uh, with that, I will turn things over to my colleague, Jody. Thank you. We really wanted to ensure that we started our conversation remembering some words of Senator Fulbright that really resonate with those of us who are international education practitioners. We do sincerely believe that we are building connections and pathways for peaceful dialogue. And in doing so, we remember this quote from Senator Fulbright, international education exchange is most significant current project designed to continue the process of humanizing mankind to the point we would hope that nations can learn to live in peace. We wanted to start our conversation with this today as we look at ways in which the current immigration environment is in contrast to what we learn are the ideals and pathways for peace, especially through international and intercultural exchange. So with that, to give you a little bit of context, in particular, we are starting with an example of a regulatory guidance um, and inconsistency that really highlights where we see a disconnect between the ideals of the Fulbright program and the practice of our regulatory framework by which our international students and scholars in this country must abide. Um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, Department of Homeland Security was really uh, tasked with looking at the current regulatory framework and making accommodations where they could so that international students could continue their study. Uh, no small feat, of course, um, but what came out of that was a real question in March as the universities were transitioning to a remote environment of how to continue educating our international students while managing their immigration compliance needs. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so um, just a little bit more context, SEVP is the Student Exchange Visitors Program and it works with DHS to help us manage the immigration compliance for those students. And pre-COVID, the immigration um, framework by which students had to abide required them to be enrolled in mostly physical face-to-face -face traditional courses. They were allowed to utilize and take um, advantage of you know, alternative methods of instruction like online courses, but at a minimum, only allowing one of those classes to count towards their minimum enrollments. And this was because they are on F and M visas, which are physical presence-based visas. And with those, the intention is that the individual is 
required to be inside of the United States to do the activity and in this case study. So when universities managed, when universities were changing to an online format, uh, DHS and SEVP really had to come up with some kind of accommodation and quickly. And in doing so, they allowed those students starting in spring and then into summer to enroll in all online courses to help facilitate the continuance of their studies in spite of the pandemic and new instructional methods at universities. Next slide, please. Where it became really uh, difficult to see that alignment between the ideals of uh, cultural exchange and compliance is in July when I submitted guidance publicly saying that the temporary accommodations and exceptions would no longer fall in place. And starting in fall 2020, international students would be required to enroll in all face-to-face -face or traditional coursework, or they would need to leave the United States. Um, this was you know, quite contradictory to all of the information we have been receiving from various interagency communications. Um, and it also put uh, universities in a really difficult situation as they themselves are planning their modes of instructions for the fall semester in a way that kept their communities um, safe while also continuing their educational uh, academics and uh, educational objectives. Next slide, please. Really quick, it's important to notice that international students have a pretty substantial economic impact in the United States. You can see here um, that according to the Institute of International Education, uh, they contributed $45 billion to the US economy in 2018. And according to NAFSA, the Association of International Education um, created or supported over 458,000 jobs. So it was, it was quite confusing when this particular guidance was released that we would see our government agencies um, so quickly put at risk a very significant economic advantage that the United States had by having these international students in the country. So quite quickly after that July 6, uh, uh, July 6 guidance was published, really quickly you saw a lot of different people in the higher education arena and the public arena, corporate, for-profit, nonprofit, come together to advocate for those students you saw institutes of higher education, most notably Harvard being the first one to bring forth lawsuit and amicus briefs against the federal government, arguing that um, putting together such a guidance would in effect make them choose between having international students and putting the health and risk um, of their, uh, the, their health and safety at risk in order to open up universities. Uh, corporations who routinely are recruiting international students upon graduation were also put at risk. And one point of clarification that's really important here is that our intensive English language students were actually specifically noted as not being eligible for any type of accommodation during these times. And so you saw a lot of our professional associations really getting together really quickly to put forth their own responses and their own advocacy protocol so that they could work together um, to try to, in fact, reverse this guidance, which a couple of weeks into July, we did have a victory in the fact that they were um, ordered and enjoined uh, to reverse that decision and go back to the SEVP guidance from March. And while it was a victory and we were happy to be able to continue to educate our international students in a health and a, in a safe way in the fall, there was a longer term impact. Um, the damage had kind of been done. Our international students received a message that they were not welcome here and that they would be used kind of almost as a pawn in this back and forth of terms of whether or not institutes of higher education would kind of be strong armed into opening. And that's where our conversation really turns to what is the theme and the matter of social justice when we're working with um, international students and scholars who are coming to the United States and um, engaging in academic activity in our higher education. Thank you, Jody. So I, I'm going to try to quickly provide some analysis and I wanna relate this again to the inequity that we see with these regulatory inconsistencies that uh, are not only present in this particular instance, but have been seen really um, over the past four years through things like the attempt 
to eliminate the DACA uh, deferred action program, the so-called Muslim ban and other efforts that even as recently as yesterday have come to the fore. And so particularly with, result to, with respect to the July 6th guidance, um, we see an equity in that this guidance would have permitted domestic students who um, could have studied remotely even prior to the pandemic to continue studying and to continue making progress toward their degrees or toward developing English proficiency, while international students, students from different countries, different cultures, different backgrounds would have been required to put their health and safety at risk. And also in the case of those who come with family members, as is often the case, to um, put their family members' health at risk simply to be able to continue to pursue the dream of an American education. For this would have forced universities to make curricular decisions based upon financial exigencies because the reality is that many institutions, particularly state and public colleges and universities, rely on the revenue generated by international students to subsidize the cost of education for domestic students. That is uh, certainly the case at my institution. I'm and, sorry, Wes. I'm sorry, Wes. You have one minute left. Okay, thank you. And, and then, in addition to that, this guidance would have forced those who were in high risk categories to jeopardize their safety and health. And particularly, this would have had a great impact on minority communities. Um, if you look at the statistics, statistics from the Bureau of Labor, uh, you will find that those who engage in building and grounds maintenance and cleaning are um, disproportionately coming from minority communities. And COVID-19 research has demonstrated thus far that if you are a black American, you are five times more likely to end up in the hospital than you are if you are white. Uh, if you get sick with COVID-19 and you are uh, Latino, you are more than two times likely to die. And this has to do with socioeconomics, access to health care, et cetera. But these are precisely the essential workers who would have been impacted by this. Um, as we mentioned, there are other issues that are ongoing, such as a recent proposal to eliminate duration of status. Uh, a sting operation that was announced yesterday in which universities and colleges were claimed to be complicit or negligent in ensuring that students are uh, doing what they say they're doing when they're seeking work experience in the US. And so we feel that we really must advocate against these types of policies that promote isolationism and that our nation is stronger when we retreat from the world because as Dr. King said, we are living together and this is something that we cannot change. It is irrevocably a, uh, irrevocably a part of our globalized society. Uh, and specifically he said, this is the great new problem of mankind. We've inherited a large house, a great world house in which we have to live together, black and white, Easterner and Westerner, Gentile and Jew, Catholic and Protestant, Muslim and Hindu, a family unduly separated in ideas, culture, and interest, who, because we can never again live apart, must learn somehow to live with each other in peace. And I would posit that international education and regulatory consistency are essential to establishing that peace. Great. Well, thank you thank so you. much. Thank you, Wesley and Jody. I think certainly, I mean, advocates are such wonderful people. And but I think the message here also is you have to be vigilant, don't you? You have to be very aware of what's going on and you know, not only day to day, minute to minute, the types of changes that could take place. So, so thank you, thank you for your good work. Thank and you. again, folks, if you have any questions for folks, just add them to the Q&A. Next, we turn to uh, Dr. Darlene DeMarie, Darlene. Well, it is an honor to be with you today. Bring this up. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Wonderful. 
So my first Fulbright was to the University of Limpopo, which is in northern South Africa, basically in a very rural place. And this story tells the story of a journey that actually began in 2002 and still continues to the present day. So in 2002, I met Professor Lily Cherian from the University of Limpopo. She told me her university wanted to start a childcare center. I had just done that at Muskingum College in my previous faculty position. And so I had to get tenure at USF first. By the time I applied, it was 2007. My Fulbright began in 2007. And my American brain assumed the child care center was up and running and my job was to make it better. When I arrived, I found an empty house and no money for renovations. So my first lesson that I learned from my Fulbright was I had skills I never knew I had. I could raise money, get donations, and I could fight with construction workers who told me a woman had no business telling a man how to build children's playground equipment. The grand opening occurred on the 12th of January, 2008, which happened to be three weeks before my Fulbright ended. I said to the American embassy, it's really a shame I didn't get to do a single thing that I have expertise to do. Fortunately, they extended my Fulbright and I got to go back to the University of Limpopo December 2008 and work there till 2009. I took pictures and video every day and a lot of the learning I had was from them. You'll see some of those. Now Fulbright's a partnership. So I'm faculty Fulbright advisor and I tell the faculty, you're not simply going to do your own work. Fulbrights bring people together with different backgrounds and different expertise. Lily's background and expertise were biology and health. So when I told her, I don't know what we're gonna do because we have to be sanitary, but we can't afford paper towels. Her idea was brilliant. Let's have different towels, different patterns for every child. And lo and behold, on the first day of school, even our two-year-olds could find their own towels. I also learned by reviewing pictures, the impact of teachers' questions. The teacher said to a boy who built a square house every single day, when he told her it was a house, she said, does your house have any other rooms? She had to go, but I witnessed what followed that. The boys went and got trucks. They were making a garage. The children started dramatic play inside the play space. And as you see by the last slide, children's block play became much more sophisticated and complicated. And I could trace it all back to that single question that provoked this. In November of 2010, I returned for the very first kindergarten graduation. You see their caps and gowns that a parent made. She said they were at a university, they have to have caps and gowns. I learned at that time that two children had scholarships to white, traditionally white private schools and were in the top 10 at those schools. Well, my next lesson was you can't predict children's success in those conventional ways. Let me show you. Here's the little boy in the top 10. This was the boy they called the ornery one. He never paid attention. While all the other children are absorbed in this book reading, he noticed everything I did. That boy was in the top 10 of his class. And here's a girl. Her family were refugees from Ethiopia. She was afraid to join, you see the fear. The teacher was reading a book, we talked about it, we decided, let her be, she's not disturbing anyone. She was the first child to go and read a book by herself. Again, she was in the top 10 of her class and exceeding in reading and math later in school. 
I told the teachers in Johannesburg where I was doing some research about my surprise that South African parents at the center sat by tribe. Now different tribes spoke different languages and we had three dominant tribe, two very dominant tribes, but parents never intermingled. The teacher gave me this poster. It said, we are more powerful together than we ever could be apart. We hung this right where parents sign their children into the child care center and sign them out. And lo and behold, their children brought them together. In 2010, when I returned and I did a parent workshop, parents of different tribes sat together. Their children united them. When they saw the pictures of their children playing with other children, they wanted to meet those parents. I realized too how photographs and videos really helped me to learn from my experiences. I returned again to the center during my sabbatical from USF. They paid for my flight, which I'm eternally grateful for. The reason I went was sad because Professor Lily Cherian passed away in 2013. And the university was in a process of trying to decide is it worth it to keep this child care center? I was scared when I returned because I didn't know, do we have the same teachers? And lo and behold, the same three teachers I hired were still there in 2016. There was only one new teacher because the center exploded in population. In 2016, the children still loved to read. The parents, though, we're asking the teachers, please emphasize academic skills. We want our children to be successful later in school. They ask them to give worksheets. This is all too familiar right now in the United States. So I did workshops for the parents about the benefits of play. I called alumni parents and I found out the success. At that point, it was seven children at the top of their classes in five different schools. And since that time, I've become a play advocate. All children have the right to play. Play provides the foundation for learning and socio-emotional development. I told this to USF's president last year when he came. I don't have time to go into all the benefits, but when I came back, I started researching all of the research on puzzles and blocks and number board games. And indeed, number board games enhance children's math achievement later in school, especially those from lower socioeconomic status. One thing that I knew from the research was that you shouldn't put too many children in one space. And lo and behold, when I had been there in 2008 and 9, we measured the space carefully. We set the maximum at 52. When I returned in 2016, there were 59. And lo and behold, there was more aggression. We see that in our own cities. I also learned the benefits of music. Music enhances children's cognitive development. I'm now doing research with Dr. Jennifer Bugis from Music Education and finding incredible findings about the benefits of music for young children's cognitive development. Again, it's especially true for children from lower socioeconomic families with lower socioeconomic status. So let me show you two children over time. First week, flat affect, look at the coloring, very lethargic. Six months later, engaging in repetitive behavior. That little boy never took that backpack off his back, even at nap time, filled up the red bucket with the red shovel and dumped it out every day. And here's 2010 when I went back. The children were alive and vibrant and their coloring was amazing. It just was profound. I learned that all children deserve high quality early childhood experiences. You can see the impact, especially for children who don't have privilege.
In 2018, the teacher came to spend three weeks with me in Tampa, Florida. Again, I'm grateful to my university who paid her flight. We traveled to Washington, D.C. for the Early Childhood Conference and presented together. She wanted to go to the African American Museum and I had an experience seeing American history through her eyes. She wasn't aware that there was slavery in America in the 1800s. We have one minute, Darlene. Perfect. We also had two seminars, one in the College of Education. I got lots of co-sponsors on education around the world. I got some Fulbright visiting students and scholars, some international students and had a panel. And we went to Sun City Center, a retirement community in Florida and presented a workshop on women's empowerment. Thanksgiving at my home was like none other I ever had. I was most thankful and Kate was most thankful for my Fulbright experience. In conclusion, the impact of our Fulbright Awards is bi-directional. It's not something you go and do. It's an experience you have that brings you together with others. Fulbright Awards do change lives. And I thank you very much for your time and attention. Well, thank you very much, Darlene. That, that's exciting work that you're doing, so important work. And it's wonderful how children can teach us, isn't it? Yes. And thinking, thinking of your experience when you first arrived, expecting all kinds of things to be there, they weren't. I think one of, one of my most favorite quotes was written 700 years ago by, by a monk, Thomas Akempis, who said, our, our, our strengths are most often seen during times of trial and tribulation. Such times do not make us weak, Rather, they show us who and what we are. And so I think we all probably on our Fulbrights had similar experiences that things weren't quite what we thought it would be, but, but we adjusted and we grew from it. Setbacks are propellers forward. Exactly. That's what I said. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Next, we would like to introduce uh, Dr. Andrea Honigsfield and Dr. Maria Dove. Uh, thank you. Hi everyone, this is Andrea Honigsfeld. And this is Maria Dove. And we're very excited to be here to be able to share with you our most recent research that we have never presented on before on how we're going to build capacity, teacher collective efficacy through co-teaching. So a little bit of an introduction about us, if you detect the accent in my voice, I was born and raised in Hungary, where I was first introduced to collaborative teaching or co-teaching. I taught in the New York City public school system. And for 20 years, I've been at Molloy College in the School of Education and Human Services. I was a Fulbright scholar in 2002 in Iceland, where there were so many non-Icelandic speaking refugees and immigrants coming at that time that I was supporting the um, Icelandic School of Education to establish a post-master's program to support Icelandic as a second language education. And if you detect my accent, I was born in Brooklyn, New York, and I have been um, privileged to be uh, one of those former ESOL teachers in uh, a public school system right in the suburbs of New York City. I taught there for approximately 30 years. And later on, I changed careers and moved on to higher education where Andrea and I have had quite a wonderful 15 years or more collaborating on the topic of teacher collaboration. No pun intended, of course, or maybe, maybe so. So as Maria mentioned, we have been collaborating for a long time. We have actually published over a dozen books together, many, many research articles, edited volumes. And as you could see, the consistent theme is collaborating and co-teaching for the sake of English learners, and also to enhance advocacy 
And um, we have two books, Breaking Down the Wall, not so hidden agenda there, and Team Up, Speak Up, Fire Up, two of our latest publications focusing on advocacy and supporting change for this population. So we love this quote by uh, Mike Smoker. Collaboration allows teachers to capture each other's funds, a fund of collective intelligence. And we sometimes like to uh, give the example of, um, of exchanging apples, the, the, uh, the George Bernard Shaw quote that allows us to think about, well, if we just exchanged apples, we'd each have one apple. But when it comes to uh, collaboration, when each of us has an idea and, it, and exchanges it, then we walk away with two ideas. And this captures um, the core of some of our publications and work, which is to engage in collaborative teaching. It's a cyclical process and it will include collaborative planning, co-instruction, collaborative assessment and reflection. And this ongoing cycle is what empowers teachers to build on each other's collective efficacy and collective intelligence. So when we think about teachers collaborating, we want to consider what their individual expertise is in their particular field. So we, when we look at the ESOL teacher, we see one who is um, really very well versed in uh, linguistics, in the language acquisition, uh, in methodologies for teaching an additional language, for understanding the standards, the English language development standards that are needed to um, allow, uh, to plan for English learners to have a trajectory of learning, as well as a cultural, cultural understanding of this population. And on the flip side, core content teachers have a whole range of knowledge and skills, as well as this position towards working with the general education population and tremendous expertise in the core content areas, specialized, specialized methods that might be needed in their content um, areas, the disciplinary literacy skills that might be communicated to the students and so forth. So as you could see on this chart from one of our earlier publications, we wanted to acknowledge and celebrate that teachers who come together and collaborate certainly come with a tremendous wealth of knowledge, understanding, and skills. Yet, if the teachers just hold on to their own set of skills and expertise, we might not be supporting our English learners or immigrant populations as best as we could. So this is at the core of our work. And very often, when we are not in a particular field teaching it, we find that what the other teacher does is quite mysterious. So to the content teacher, ESOL teachers are mysterious. It's like, what do they do? How do they go about supporting uh, students to develop uh, an additional language? And the same with ESOL teachers, the core content curriculum sometimes can be very baffling. So think about what it would be like if these types of teachers regularly collaborated. And that's pretty much what we have been thinking about for over 10 years. And just recently, finally, we solidified our field-based research into a dual capacity model, which is a theoretical framework to recognize capacity building for teacher learning, to recognize that through this process of collaboration, teachers expand their own understanding and skills. But also through this process of collaboration, we're building student learning capacity as well. So we're gonna dig a little deeper into this. As you could see on the left-hand side, we talk about content teachers and ESOL teachers learning about each other's areas of expertise. And when it's in support of student learning, both teachers have to focus on language and literacy integration in every lesson. And both teachers also need to fully embrace that language does not exist in isolation. It has to be systematically, intentionally, purposefully connected to the core content areas. And in our research, what we have noted when we have observed uh, teachers 
who are working together, uh, co-teaching with the ESOL teacher and a content area teacher, we find very often that the longer they have been teaching together, the longer these roles, uh, their, their teaching roles are really fluid. And one we'll see is uh, adopting the other strategies. So in our work, we often talk about changing paradigms, changing pronouns. So instead of talking about my students, your students, my kids, your kids, when we embrace that all of our students are our students in a given classroom, we approach working with the student population from a very different perspective. And the same way we look at the idea of my job and your job, it's no longer just this, uh, if I'm an ESOL teacher, I am the one who is teaching the English language learners and my sole responsibility is English language development. We find that teachers who collaborate have a new definition of their job because it's now our job. The idea that we're all, we're both sharing uh, the, um, the job of uh, making sure that English learners are acquiring language skills alongside of content area skills. So again, that shared ownership is really critical for capacity building for teacher learning. As you could see, this summary of our first part of our theoretical framework emphasizes that content area teachers, classroom teachers, as well as con core content specialists at the secondary level will need to develop a solid understanding of the language features of their academic core content, also referred to as disciplinary literacy. So writing a science report is very different from writing a haiku poem and content teachers need to be intentional about how language is used in their own content areas. Maria, would you like to introduce the second half of this theory? Absolutely. For ESOL teachers, they now have to consider how they are going to adopt the understand, their understanding of core content standards and grade level expectations. They also have to develop essential knowledge and skills of the different curricula in which they will be co-teaching and or collaborating within. To, in order to make sure that uh, their English learners are uh, well-versed in not just language development, but developing the, uh, the general education curriculum. So how fitting is it that we're talking about this theory right after the previous presentation? Because we too are capturing bi-directional learning here. So thank you for that language. I think we might infuse that in our own theory. Yes. Love that bi-directional learning taking place. So similarly, when we think about our students learning, we have to look at it uh, from through, uh, through two different lenses, content attainment, again, access to the core content areas, because that's the only way that they can be academically successful. And the second angle is language and literacy development, both in and outside of the classroom. So we have a favorite word or prefix that we often tell teachers when we work in the classroom or in our college classes, and that prefix is multi. Thinking about if there's only one word, one prefix, we would want every single teacher to take away from our workshops, from our books, is that working with this population has to be multidirectional multimodal, multisensory, multilingual, offering multiple access points. There's not one, one right way of working with English learners. One minute, please. Thank you. And, and then when we look at the language and literacy development, we want teachers not just to focus on the vocabulary in their content, but really help students string that, those words together to form sentences and understand discourse and text level. And then of course we focus on the swirling classroom where students are speaking, writing, interacting, reading and listening in every classroom, in every lesson, every day to support the uh, language development of English learners. So again, coming back to our integrated collaborative service delivery model, we translated this model, um, expanded it to the dual capacity framework on the next slide, Maria. And this is how we expanded 
the dual capacity model as an overlay to our collaborative instructional cycle. Just there's a lot, lot of text in here and we know our time is up, but we wanted to make sure that the theory is applicable and transferable to the classroom. We want to thank everyone for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. And, and thank you for your wonderful presentation. You are good role models for collaborative work, aren't you? That's the, that, that's the first message that's communicated. And uh, I would just mention to our, our viewers that uh, if you go to the uh, Fulbright website uh, under their biographies, they do list some of the books that they have written. So I would encourage you to do that. You've seen a slide of all of them, but some of them are also mentioned on the website. So uh, very well done. Well, all of our presenters, I've just really loved it. And you've done a wonderful job. Uh, Munir, are there any questions? I don't, I don't see any questions listed in the... I think I think some of the panelists uh, answered them uh, via chat while um, during the the presentation. So if you have if you have some questions, Rob, uh, we have a little bit of time. Right. Actually, a, a question I always like to ask is that uh, I love the saying that the shortest distance between two people is a story. Now I I had asked uh, at the very beginning I had asked Celia for a story about you know a specific story about a, a student or an event. So we have, we have five minutes left. Um, does anyone want to share a story of some, some success uh, story or some, maybe it wasn't so successful, but something that you learned out of it? Something very specific. Andrea, do you, or Maria, do you have a story? Oh, we have a lot of stories. I think one <laughs> of our favorite story is visiting a school in a particular part of the United States where a taxi driver did not want to drive us to. They said, do you really want to go into that neighborhood? And we said, yes, we do want to go there. And once we got there, we have seen the absolutely most collaborative, most amazing education taking place under the leadership of an exceptional educator, a principal. And we asked the principal, what's your secret? And he said to us, now, whatever your priority is, whatever you believe in, that's going to be what your priority is. And collaboration, co-teaching, supporting English learners, as well as students who might be um, multilingual learners, um, was really, truly shining through everything that he has done in that building. Is that the story you wanted to tell, Maria? Too? That's good. That's perfect. Absolutely. Yes, thank, you. thank you. Yes, <laughs> very good. Um, Maylene and, and Marco, do you have a story about a specific event or a student that that you value, Treasure? So just I want to tell you that when, uh, as, as an English coordinator in Ecuador, so I have had the opportunity to, to know different kind of Fulbrights. So it was great for me. And every year, I know an interesting person. So because they have different characteristics, they are from different states. So I learn more. So in total now in our, in our university, uh, we have six. So for that reason, every year I learn new things. So that's interesting because they share with me how they celebrate, how they do things, special things in their state. So it's great for me and good experience. Great, thank you. A great story, thank you. How about Wesley and Jody? Do you have a, a story that a particular event or particular student? Um, I don't have an, a story specific to my Fulbright experience, but specific to our presentation, it has been really phenomenal to see international students as well as included in that are our Fulbright students and scholars come together to contribute to the community while they've kind of been stuck in the community with, you know, not a lot of mobility. And we had students in our public health in downtown Atlanta passing out masks very early on in the pandemic um, while they were guests here. And so that was really, um, for me, that was, you know, just really promising. And it, it showed how they had already made those ties and those connections to the community that they felt it important to give back, even when they themselves were struggling. Good, thank you. Thank you. I would just add uh, quickly that 
um, a lot of people, when they hear the term advocacy, they are a bit frightened because they think, well, I don't really know how to communicate with my legislator. But getting involved in advocacy is not that difficult. And in fact, um, everyone can go to connectingourworld.org and register for free. And you can have access to all sorts of tools that will aid you in advocating. And sometimes it's as simple as inserting your name in a template letter. Great, good, thank you. Thank you very much. Darlene, do you have a specific story? My story is going to be a commercial for this Fulbright Association because <laughs> one of the one of the successes has been uh, connecting with other Fulbright alumni. Even in the chat, there's already connections. This organization is incredible in helping people from different disciplines and different different new types of universities or occupations come together. And I think when we work together, we can really accomplish wonderful things. So <laughs> that's good. my commercial. Nobody paid me to say that. <laughs> okay, very good, thank you. Actually, we have a question from Catherine. I know that there, there is a lot of, I know that a lot of recent Fulbrighters whose experiences are interrupted because of the pandemic. Do any of the presenters have any suggestions for staying connected to the communities they had to leave or did not get to go to? How have you stayed connected with your communities or never got to go to them? We discovered WhatsApp. <laughs> and so now I'm able to email with the teachers um, more than I've ever communicated before in the years past. Mm -hmm. Very good, thank you. Um, anyone else? How have you been keeping in, in touch with each other? Well, good. I think we, we've pretty much run out of time. Once again, thank you so much for your contributions, for your wonderful presentations. And thank you to, for the folks that are, have been watching. I would just add that tomorrow, the conference begins again tomorrow at 10.30 with a uh, panel session on education. So thank you once again. Thank you to the folks behind the scenes, Manir and Shaz, and uh, we appreciate your help very much. So goodbye. Thank you.